Amandla. Amandla. Long live Comrade Neville. Long live. Long live Comrade Neville. Long live. A heartfelt salute from friends and comrades in Johannesburg who couldn't be here. This wonderful gathering, which no doubt would have pleased Neville uh, immensely. Um, as you heard from Comrade Lydia, I've been given 10 minutes uh, <laughs> to speak on an issue that we can't do justice to for hours and hours. Neville's contribution spanning half a century is so immense, so creative, so rich, that it will keep us occupied for many, many, many years to come. So I'm not going to be very ambitious at all. Um, if, mind you, I'm a young man from Johannesburg, if I was asked to discuss Comrade Neville and socialism in Cape Town, from Johannesburg in the 80s, early 80s or 90s, it would probably feel akin to the early Christians um, that were entering the Colosseum uh, in Roman times before Emperor Constantine. Um, Comrade Lydia, please don't count the slogans, okay, in my attendance. But I think if today, and it, it reminds me of this tweet that one of the editors. South African newspaper sent around. He said that in the 80s and early 90s, the politicos were divided into two groups in Cape Town. The one group for Neville, and the other group against Neville. Now, if you tweet, you would know that you have a certain number of characters. So the next tweet Nick sent was, and today, and in fact since the late 90s, all those who were against Neville are today strong supporters of Neville's views. Um, so I don't feel as intimidated as I would have felt uh, earlier on. By the way, talking about tweeting, that's one of the unfinished projects, uh, let alone tweeting. Neville just didn't want to go near Facebook. Uh, unfinished project like the unfinished revolution. Um, I clearly just want to speak to one important issue, his revolutionary practices, because I think this captures his contribution. This praxis provided us simultaneously with a set of intellectual ideas and practical strategies in forming the role of a revolutionary socialist in South Africa. Like most uh, Marxists of his time, Comrade Neville was schooled in 19th and early 20th centuries conceptions of a revolutionary, drawing on various traditions, various struggles in the East and everywhere else in the world, in Europe as well, as well as the historic insurrections of working class and peasantry in Europe and Asia. He also drew on the iconic revolutionaries of the independence struggle. Some of you might know that he in fact knew Ben Bella very well. Um, Comrade Neville was seeped in the literature and the contributions of Amilcar Cabral. Uh, he read Rosa Luxemburg, Amil, uh, 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 Antonio Gramsci, he discussed the Paris Commune with us, and in the 80s he also told us why the German revolutionaries paid when they went on the trams to make the revolution. Of course, our impost was, well, that's why Germany didn't have a revolution at the end. But the important point is that these contributions and influences on Neville are inadequate for describing Neville's revolutionary praxis because relying on these sources alone would be both ahistorical and out of context. Neville's life and work builds on these traditions creatively. He extended 
them and he amplified them contextually. He did not accept them dogmatically. And for a long time he was subjected to not analysis, but doctrinaire formulae slogans with a huge dollar of insults. He was called ultra-leftist, he was called centrist, and a whole range of things. I mean, Neville's work anachronistically Trotskyite as well. But he took this and he chided people, but he gently taught people that that is not the way of our traditions. And his approach transcended the limitations of this formulaic interpretation of 19th century vanguardism, because for him his Marxism was not doctrinaire nor dogmatic. He did say that if conditions are right, and many of us who knew them understood that we believed him, that he would be the first on the front line, that if conditions were such that you needed a Bolshevik type of vanguard party, he would be the first to be part of this, such a tight organization. And this was the integrity of Neville and the way he saw things not in a dogmatic way. He avoided both the class reductionist interpretation of social change and indeed for South Africa the essentialism of racist categorization. He had a much more nuanced, complex interpretation of change based on his understanding of the national question, which was both an expression of evolving capitalist relations and the evolution of nation states in conditions which were contextually different from European nations and their formations. In fact, he found European, amongst European Russian socialist debates inadequate for describing the phenomenon of nationalism, self-determination, nation, or more generally, the national question in post-colonial states. Non-sectarianism was essential to this revolutionary praxis. It was a key attribute of Neville's revolutionary being. And his aversion to dogmatic approaches was also key to understanding his commitment to socialist practice that was non-sectarian, even anti-sectarian. While he was a proud leading member of many of the organizations you heard, his approach was always to attempt to bring together different stands of radical ideas into a collective and a purposeful enterprise. He renounced the idea that the capture of the state in itself was an adequate condition for socialist transformation. He talked about the war of position. In a sense, his work on language in relation to relations of power, social relations, his work in culture more broadly in education is an extension of this view of the war of position. He regarded this approach as having the potential, that is the approach of just seeing the capture of the state politically, not even in terms of its extension economically. He regarded that limited approach as paralyzing political activism, since for as long as it re remained unrealizable in practice, there was little else one could do in his view. Power was widely, even if unequally distributed, and the con contradictions of capitalist social relations made it available to social agency. That was why his approach was for finding ways to penetrate, all the time, constantly, to penetrate social and political institutions through practice, as it were, from below. And as a revolutionary, contemplation, reflection, theory, and action were inseparable attributes of a revolutionary, a 
the Netherlands revolutionary praxis. His was a genuine expression of Marx's aphorism, not the Marx Uncle Gabby talked about. In his thesis on Feuerbach, the role of philosopher was not just to interpret the world, but to change it. And the real strength of his revolutionary ideas was an orientation to activism in and out of the state, in the struggles of the poor, urban, or rural, marginalized, working class organizations and communities, and wherever struggles for social justice were to be found. Many of us here recall Neville when he went on his constant rounds of Hespasuk, the care and the attention he gave to people. He listened to the poor, to the working class, without condescension, without having a patronizing attitude. And it wasn't just the Luxembourgs and the Gramsci's that educated him. It was this interaction with the grassroots he was very fond of quoting Brecht because of the profound views, but yet simple views, of Bertolt Brecht. In one of his essays recently, Robin Hood, Robin Island, and the post-apartheid state towards the end of last year, he quoted Brecht as saying, injustice is human, but more human still is the war against injustice. Very importantly, underlying his revolutionary approach was the idea of alternatives and demonstrable possibilities, concrete possibilities, not abstract thought. His was an approach that went beyond social critique and mere academic analysis, beyond the boundaries constructed by the requirements of conventional scholarship, since engagement was inseparable from scholarly activity. And you can see this from a long time ago. His dossier on Robben Island, first published by UCT Press in 1994, but written 20 years before, Methodol, he used a particular scholarly approach. This was partly to disguise the fact that they didn't find the person who wrote these essays, they talked about the conditions, the torture, the humiliation that we've heard, but it was also Neville's rigor as a scholar which combined young people involved in education struggles. Some of the people here, I could see the faces. We had numerous meetings with communities, with students. There were committees formed, famous committees, the Committee of 81, etc. And there was engagement, lively debate. Some used the slogan very crassly, liberation before education. And Neville said education for liberation. And let's not give up the schools. Let's not give up the universities. <laughs> for him, those institutions, as well as non-formal and informal education, organic intellectuals, in the institutions, though, they had a moral responsibility to stimulate intellectual activism and democratic practice, both through the production of knowledge and the practice of teaching. His was a long view of history, infusing his persistent and consistent optimism. He constantly told us this is a long march. He was convinced that in the contradictory social spaces that 
characterize capitalist social relations and the struggles against it by ordinary people and communities. There were possibilities always for a genuinely democratic future. And he rejected with contempt the mantra that there is no alternative. He used the word TEMBA, an acronym which also means hope in one of our indigenous languages, a few of them actually. There must be an alternative, is what he said. That is why Neville was not just a practitioner of a liberatory pedagogy. He was the very incarnation of a revolutionary pedagogy. Now, there is really no time to list his contributions to socialist thought and practice. I just want to make a list of some for us to do a lot of work on later on. His view of the United Front, for example. His critique of the Four Nation Theses. His view of racial capitalism, when those who saw racism as some kind of separation from capitalism itself, or apartheid from capitalism. His critique of the National Democratic Revolution, his view of culture and what he called we need a cultural revolution. And also while he was an internationalist to the core, he constantly talked about comrades behaving as equals. He talked about this hub and spokes relationship where those in London or Paris or if you may even Caracas these days pass on the line. He talked rather of being equals, looking at our own conditions in this country. But most importantly, comrades, he appealed to us to get back to the modesty, the humili humility, and the generosity of spirit that inspired most of us in earlier days. When he talked about the post-apartheid state, there are a number of brilliant essays. I refer people to the speech he gave at the uh, Steve Beaker Memorial and the Strini Woodley Memorial lecture. But when he was talking about the state that it is not neutral. It's not floating above space outside of the class struggle. He said people will come to realize this very quickly. And writing in the face of the service delivery protests, protests for local accountability, Neville said that the final disillusionment will come, of course, when the repressive apparatuses of the state, instead of supporting the exploited classes and the oppressed strata, turn their weapons on the masses to protect the interests of the capitalist class. And he said that the response of police personnel to many of the so-called service delivery protests prefigures what I am saying here, written a year before the London Marikana massacre. So finally, comrades, perhaps the most enduring characteristic of his revolutionary life was his self-effacing sacrifice, his utter dedication and his tireless commitment to radical humanism, his deep, intense love for the people he worked with, all of you here, and for the people he worked for. All of this made him such 
an outstanding revolutionary socialist by his own definition. Perhaps the best and most instructive teacher and mentor we have ever had. So clearly we are immeasurably poor without him, but yet we are enriched by his example, by his ideas, and this has steeled us in the present battles and the future battles. We mourn Comrade Neville deeply, but Neville wanted us to know, and we do know that the struggle continues.